Pamela Wagner, thank you so much for being on the ROI Online Podcast. Thank you so much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So first of all, this is cool. I haven't interviewed anyone that's come that's called in from Ghana to be on the podcast. What in the world? Yeah, it's amazing, right? I mean, the thing is, you know, I need, I need sunshine, warm weather, good food, great people. So it was kind of like a no-brainer for me to come here. So your company is Ajala Digital, and you help um, your clients get their act together with their their ad campaigns. These are established companies, you know, that that are ready to really get busy and kill it with the ads. Um, tell us a little bit about your backstory and why you began your company. Because the folks that are listening, they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs, they're marketing directors, and this comes across their their uh, desk at times, and they have to make good decisions on this. Absolutely. So. I started working at Google right after I finished my master's degree, which was not really something I planned, right? I kind of like stumbled upon it and I didn't even dare to dream that I could work there. But thank God I had some amazing people around me that pushed me, mentored me and helped me. And so I joined the company and not like I had a lot of like marketing knowledge before, right? It was more like I was this generalist who then Google wanted to form into an ad specialist, right? And within about a year, I became really good at everything around Google ads, Google analytics, because we worked with more than about 2000 advertisers. So it's like the insight I got into accounts was incredible. Right. And so then I left the company and I was still a bit unsure. I was like, what is it that I can offer to people right now? <laughs> you know, um, and then slowly I started taking on different projects and noticed that there was actually huge value in the knowledge that I'd gained because there are only very few people outside that have knowledge to that depth and are that efficient in its application and therefore can deliver real results. So as time went on, had projects just focus on really getting, having a few projects, but good reviews and, and getting you know, the first referrals so after about four months, I'd made more money in a month than I'd made at Google in a month. And so I was like, okay, like, let me make this official. Let me create a company. Cause if I managed to figure it out this far, then of course, you know, I'll manage to figure out how to like scale it and, and make it sustainable. Now, mind you, um, my parents had never finished really university. I even started it and they are not entrepreneurs, right? So there were a lot of first time things along the way. And so, yeah, now it's been five years and we got clients from literally Hawaii to New Zealand, done trainings in like Myanmar, Philippines, Uganda, Jamaica, you know, so yeah, it's been huge fun. So what's, um, what's the significance of the name Ajala? So that actually dates back to um, the first time I went to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is Nigeria. Um, now I was 18 back then, very, very young. Um, a lot of people would call me crazy for that move, but I have a very close connection with that country. And so within the past years, since I've traveled a lot, I've, I've been to 80 countries now, a lot of my Nigerian friends started calling me Miss Ajala. And Ajala is a Nigerian traveler that used to travel through the whole continent. And so it's like Miss Traveler. So there's a word that comes from the language Yoruba and means traveler. And since I didn't want to use my own name or, or I couldn't think of anything else, I was like, okay, let me just add digital to it. And then I got a company name. And if I want to change it, I can always change it, but haven't found a better name yet. I love it. That's a great story. So it's like um, you're on a journey, not just a, a a traveler, but you're like all the folks that listen to this, we're on a journey with our businesses, right? And, and so in my book, I talk about when is the time to really get busy with the ad campaign. And that's, that's after you establish the system that is ready to harvest all this activity. Tell me, you know, on your website, you really make it clear you work with companies that are already at a certain level 
um, business. Why is that? So we have noticed that when you have, for example, startups of people that are in the first couple of months of their business and they want to throw money at ads, but don't really know the dynamics of ads or don't have their business model yet figured out or their communication, they just feel like they're throwing out money because maybe the website isn't yet good enough on mobile. So people just jump off again, right? Or you haven't figured out out your funnel yet. So you don't even know how to capture the people that are coming in or measuring it, right? And also a lot of times people are not yet fully clear on what they, what value they offer or what they're selling. So maybe they would say, oh yeah, you know, we, we sell the cheapest furniture ever. I'm like, that's nice, but that's not what the customer cares about. What problem is it that you solve, right? And unless you can't tell me that, then it's, you should, you know, work maybe with a brand specialist or communication specialist, but don't put money at ads yet. Mm. Yeah. And I think a lot of people fall into that trap. You see, you get all these um, emails from Facebook and Google, and they want to like give you a credit to start running ads right away. But most of the companies that get those, they're not ready for them. No. And it's, you know, I always tend to say once Google was for everyone, once Google ads was for everyone, but that's not the case anymore with the way that digital marketing has evolved and with the way that Google ads has evolved, right? And really it's a lot of people often end up just disappointed and feeling like they've wasted all their money. And then they kind of say like, oh, it doesn't work for me when actually it's just not the right stage at the right moment, you know? So help us envision when is the right stage to start considering ads? So I would prefer if a business has made at least six figures, then I know, okay, you know how to make money. <laughs> you know what it feels like to, to, you know, maybe lose money, right? To sometimes spend money without knowing whether it's coming back or not. Um, you have invested a solid amount into your website. I mean, it's 2020, but I tell you, see if we still have the same issues as in 2010, right? They are not mobile optimized, you know, the speed is slow, um, plugins aren't up updated and so on, right? And, you know, you already played around with the funnel, right? You know what a funnel is, right? You either have some sort of an email list or you have a strategy for an e-commerce business where, you know, we're retargeting people that, that have... Um, dropped out of the cart or something, right? Mm -hmm. So have those certain basics there. So, you know, a lot of people, and there's organic campaigns, campaigns that you create content on a regular basis, you're publishing videos, maybe you're doing podcasts, you're, you're creating content that people can sit from a distance and evaluate your offering. They can learn about you, they can see what your personality is, they can explore your, your services. But then there's a time that you would add you would pay for ads to start showing up on certain platforms, but there's so, there's so many moving parts to those ads, your budgets, your, your targeting, your keywords, where does, where do you start to really, how would you sit and work with a company and start to get the fundamentals solid and in place before you begin this? So the first point for us to check is always, do you actually have Google Analytics properly implemented? <laughs> as, as simple as that sounds, but 90% of the time it's not the case. And then secondly, Google Analytics even isn't even properly set up. So people aren't even yet using remarketing audiences, um, maybe e-commerce isn't properly functioning and so on. And then when we look at the Google Ads side, what we like in the beginning, we usually have the most leverage on is keywords, first of all. Mm -hmm. So for example, there was like a Swiss luxury hotel we were working with and they, they were showing up for keywords of like three-star hotels in Casablanca, which is in Morocco, right? So of no use to them, but because they hadn't set up the keywords properly, they were wasting about 50% of their budget, which is a lot, right? So work on that and then really make sure that the rest of the campaign settings are, 
are done well. This is where a lot of people also miss big leverage. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Like I always tell people, you shouldn't look into your Google ads campaigns every single day. Like you're doing something wrong if you feel like you have to do that. Like once every week, once every two weeks is enough if you know which buttons to push. So that sounds, uh, it's easier said than done. So how much traffic do you need to start to have good insight on a good sampling of data and user, um, yeah, user recordings or data to really start to get good, healthy insights? So, I mean, even if you're starting off, I would say just make sure you got Google Analytics in there. You can already get some insights from like two, 3,000 visitors a month, but really where we start talking and where we start, you know, being able to use custom audiences is more towards eight to 10,000 users a month. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. then where you can, you know, start recognizing patterns, interests, in market audiences, play with remarketing. That's when it gets fun. All right, so let's let's go through some of those terms. So you've got remarketing, you've got, what are some of the other terms here? Give us some definitions and help us to start to get a, lo a little clarity. For you, it all makes sense, but for some of the folks, they're going, what's the difference in these particular types of audiences? So, for example, if we talk about an in-market audience, that is people who have shown a strong interest in purchasing either something like your product or something similar. So that's usually a very good audience to target of new people that are not yet familiar with your brand, but actually really want to get something that you offer. Mm -hmm. In terms of remarketing, that means that you're targeting people who've already been in touch with your brand. Sometimes people might also refer to it as retargeting, remarketing, it's both the same. Now, that could be people on your email list. It could be people that have visited your website. It could be people that, you know, have put a, a product in the shopping cart but haven't checked out yet. Could be people who've been on, on your YouTube channel or in your app. So there's a lot of different ways of remarketing you got there. And... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I think just one term I wanted to clarify, which is keywords. It sounds simple, but... I want to make the, the, the distinguishment between keywords and search terms. Mm -hmm. So keywords are the keyword phrases that you enter in Google ads for which you want to show up. And search terms are the actual terms that people type in Google when your ad shows up. So you get a search term report, but you can actually then, which you can use to even refine your keywords more. So you know, my experience with Google Analytics is over time, they started to diminish the, the, the keyword data of the search terms that you were showing up for. Slowly over time, they hid those to, I guess, to really um, target those that were exploiting keyword searches or really keyword stuffing. How do, we, how do we identify what it is that folks are finding us? So I really feel that the search term report in Google ads is, is quite extensive usually and helpful. Um, it's especially if you use the keyword option of broad match modifier, that helps you to figure out what else are people looking for. So for example, if I offer prom dresses, right? Blue prom dresses. Are you looking to buy them? Are you looking to rent them, right? Are you looking for specific sizes? And then with the data that I get, I can then refine either my keywords or even get inspiration for blog articles, right? Or, or even business. If I see a lot more people looking for renting blue prom dresses, then I probably would want to look into uh, uh, making that offer on my website. So these, um, so these, a lot of folks think that you have to put somehow put these keywords or the search terms on your web page in some way, but actually there's uh, content topics or topic clusters, there's videos, there's all these ways that you can start to really help your, your platform be robust and, uh, and communicate to Google or the search engines what your, your prom dress site is about. What are some good tips that you would share with folks that are going, oh, how can we do better with SEO? 
Yeah, so I think it's important to notice that it's not anymore about keyword stuffing when you mentioned, right? Like this is this has been outdated. Google already told us, no, this is not what we're looking at or our algorithms are smarter than that. So on the one hand, yes, of course, make sure you have the right keywords in there, but don't overdo it. So make sure it makes sense. And then something that Google values highly is how does your website perform on mobile? Because we have way more traffic on mobile now than we have on desktop, it really prioritizes those pages that perform well on mobile, right? And then the other thing is, can people actually easily find my content or find the content that they want to have on the page, right? Do I need to scroll a lot? Do I need to zoom in and out? Or do I actually have clear call to action buttons? So for example, a common mistake is that people have three to four different calls to actions on one page. One is like, contact us. One is shop now. One is learn more. And then another one, right? But you got to know that people are constantly suffering from information overload. And the easier you make it for them to make a decision, the quicker they will buy from you, sign up for your newsletter, take the action that you want them to take. So this sounds like more that the experience that you're creating online for your visitors, the people, the humans that have these human brains that are evaluating what you do. It sounds like Google's wanting you to do better in that area rather than try to manipulate and trick their search algorithms. Yeah. So I think Google is, you know, people can say as much as, you know, whatever they want, but I really feel like there's a genuine intent to offering the user the best possible experience and giving them the information they need as quickly as possible. So whatever Google does is with that intent in mind. That's kind of hard when it's a digital environment for, for a business to figure out how to really excel in that area, no? Yeah, and especially when it when everything's changing so quickly and when just that area of digital marketing alone has grown so much. Like, I mean, now, yes, you can study digital marketing degrees and we're starting to have digital marketing degrees, but we should actually be already at that level where we have, you know, content marketing, a bachelor in content marketing, right? Or um, a master in SEO because there's so much alone in those sub areas. So what, give me, help me have some basic ideas on, on how we can start to acclimate our team to do better in, in creating the platforms that would do well when we're designing ad campaigns. So you mean how how to help the team do it better or how to use the platforms better. Yeah. So if, if you were to work with our team, for example, where would you start? What are some of the basics and fundamentals that you would want the team to be really good at? Obviously we're at that level where an ad campaign would be uh, applicable. So how would you like orient a team to really do well? I think I'd first of all, make sure that they understand where the 20% where they can have 80% of the leverage, right? So everything me and my team do is according to the 80, 20 rule. Okay. I'd also want you to understand that you don't have to spend a lot more time on it. You have, just have to know what to look for. Okay. So something ex mm -hmm. explain to me the 2080 concept that let's play like I'm kind of dense. Okay. Which is not hard. So tell me, help me understand what you mean by that. Yeah. So the, the most, so even though we have about six campaign types now in Google ads, search, display, shopping, et cetera, search is the one that people use most. So we'd first look at the search campaigns. Are they actually properly set up? What's often overlooked in search campaign, search campaigns next to proper keyword match types and this keyword settings is bit adjustments. So look at the devices that, that your ads are playing on. You usually have desktop, smartphone, and tablet. Mm -hmm. um, which one's performing best? Can you then add a bit adjustment to that? So it performs even better. Bit adjustments? Yes. Yeah, so I could say add 
So Google, if there are any searches on mobile devices, you can add, for example, up to 30% to my bid to make sure that my ad shows up as highly as possible, mm. right? Okay. Or if we stick with devices, what we also often see is that a lot of budget would go, for example, towards mobile because maybe the cost per click is cheap, but where the conversions are coming from is desktop. But then desktop is only getting maybe 10% of the budget. Mm. So if that's the case, what we do is then split up the campaigns so that you have one mobile focused campaign with a separate budget and then the desktop campaign with a separate budget. So you get both, but really, you know, make sure that you get the right return of ad spend too. Okay, I love that. That makes sense. So that would be on the search or the display? Search, so that would be on the search side. Okay, so let's let's cover the six topics there. Search, display, what else? So we got search campaigns, display campaigns, video YouTube campaigns, app campaigns, shopping campaigns, and then we have smart campaigns or and discovery campaigns. So it's kind of like seven even now. S smart or discovery campaigns? Yeah, so we have smart campaigns and then we have also discovery campaigns. It's actually seven types now. It could be that in some accounts you don't see those two yet because they're so new um discovery campaigns are a mix between display youtube and gmail so a gmail campaign is a subtype of a display campaign wow. <laughs> um, and then a smart campaign is like uh, an attempt from google to make it easy for you to create a campaign that mixes targeting of cold traffic and remarketing so you, you can get in the weeds real fast with all of this. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And figuring out which campaign type is right for which purpose might not always be that easy. So let me give an example from lead generation, probably mm -hmm. with a lot of people interested and you want to build your, re your, mark, your email list and you have a freebie that you're offering, a free guide, right? And most likely you're using Facebook ads already to generate leads there, maybe a lead gen campaign or a conversion campaign. And then a lot of times people would turn to Google and want to do a display campaign expecting the same results because it looks like it's kind of similar, but it's actually not. It works way different because with a display campaign, I catch people on random sites. I mean, of course there's targeting to it, right? But also getting that right can take some time but it's much more branding versus on Facebook or Instagram. I really, if the ad is good, I take an action. It's quick and easy. So that's where some mistakes happen. So we actually just had a discussion today with one of our clients who's a coach and she wanted to do that to drive traffic towards a, a masterclass site. And we thought about it we're like, you know, the best thing to do here would actually be a true view for action campaign, which is a video type campaign, but where you can generate leads from it. So it, it's a video campaign with an integrated lead form. And that one can really work well. But you have to know that, first of all, in Google ads, you have to click on leads first, that you then have to click on video and then which campaign type to choose. So it's not easy to know that, right? Yeah. So, you know, the folks that are listening, they're going, oh my gosh, this is really, you can really get sophisticated and I, it's confusing where to even start, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It, it, yeah. So how long does it take you to, to evaluate and do an audit of a platform to come up with some really good suggestions? And that now I'm understanding your 80-20 principle really well. Yeah. Give us... So, I mean, for me, it's because I was trained at doing that at Google, right? Usually if I have a first conversation with a client, that's about 45 minutes to an hour and that's it, right? Um, at Google, sometimes it was even possible within a couple of minutes, if it wasn't a lot of campaigns, because you know exactly where to look at, what to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you don't know that, it can take you days or weeks sometimes. Wow. So What's the kind of budgets now? You know, I know it's going to depend, right? But 
So let's say that they engage you and you spend a week evaluating their platform. You're going to come back with some sort of campaign that would be in line with the strategy that they have in place. Um, yeah, what, what does that look like? I'm trying to get a really good handle on, on your actual, yeah, your expertise and how you're going to finesse this. Yeah, so it's sometimes within a week, you know, that it could work that you already see some improvements. Sometimes it can take multiple weeks, right? So like I never guarantee anything. Usually if we work together with clients, it's for a quarter because this is where you can really test a lot, drive some good results and really get super focused on what works. In terms of budget, you know, if you have two to three K a month available, then that's a solid amount that you can already work with pretty well. So, I mean, we had clients come to us and we're like, oh my God, you know, the other agency told us we should use like 10 K, you know, we need that as a minimum. No, you don't need that much. You really don't. Um, is I, I really like to have a good base amount, optimize that properly and then see what works and then scale from there. So you're doing little bitty test campaigns until you start to get clar clarity on what you were uh, suspecting? So we'd usually start off with a certain campaign strategy. So using different campaign types, mm -hmm. and then we'd optimize those and, and see what works and, and adjust them. And so the, the optimization adjustments usually happen every one to two weeks, depending on the campaign type and the goals. In general, there's also quite a lot of analytics work involved. So really helping the client understand where do my customers jump off? What can I do better? Um, you know, where can I optimize it? Um, simple things is like bounce rates or e-commerce conversion rates. That's what a lot of people almost don't see anymore or don't look at anymore because there's so much into it that it's just, they don't see it anymore. So oftentimes it just helps to really have an outsider look at your account and whatever you're doing because they have that fresh perspective. You know? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of consulting as far as the page, the, the content on the page and the calls to action. Are you running AB campaigns? Are you running other, other things other than ads? We focus purely on ads but we help clients with the optimization of the landing pages. So of course it could be sometimes that clients have those AB tests running for the landing pages, but it's usually on their side and we just help them consult them. Right. Wow. So, so let's talk about the different platforms that you can run ads on. Right. So everybody thinks just Google, but obviously there's YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, Give us a good uh, clarity on what other platforms we should consider. So the ones that we have been focusing on for different clients is Amazon ads, which is something rather new, but um, can be very, very good for your traffic if you're new and if you're one of the first ones in your niche. Bing ads in some instances. So while Bing only has about three to 4% market share, it can offer a very nice additional pocket money, so to speak. So if you figured out something works in Google ads, then chances are, if you replicate it correctly on Bing ads, that it'll work out too. Then we got LinkedIn ads, which can be very niche and sometimes expensive. So it really depends on what you're advertising. Um, well, we have YouTube ads. YouTube is part of Google ads always. And then we got Instagram, which is part of Facebook, in terms of like Snapchat or TikTok, unfortunately, I can't speak much on that or Twitter. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of different platforms out there. I would never say you need them all. I would say, first of all, get clear who's your target audience. What is, what is your value proposition? What is the problem you're solving? And then start with the platforms where you think that your audience spends the most time on. What's the biggest change that you've seen in the last five years of how people evaluate and 
decide to buy. I am not sure if it's if it has really changed on the people side, but I think we as marketers have understood more about the fact that people buy according to our emotions and not necessarily, you know, I think Simon Sinek says people buy why you do it, not what you do. Mm -hmm. So people have become more aware of that and adjust, started adjusting their messages to that. And I think that's where we see a lot of digital businesses succeed and do really, really well because they understand how to speak emotionally to people and show them how they can really solve their problems. Whereas a lot of like mom and pop stores or physical stores are often tied to, oh, we have to cheat this product or whatever, right? Um, so yeah, it's really, really understanding emotions um, and, and really getting clarity on, on the role that psychology plays in marketing. So um, what's the biggest, what's the biggest train wreck you've seen in doing this? And then what is a, a contrast it with like a really great success? So, so help me out. I'm not a uh, native yeah. speaker of English. Train wreck is like mistake or failure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, we, we had this great intention and then it just, just went to pieces. Um, I remember working with a rather young company in Austria that created some sort of a new kind of loudspeakers and they, I mean, the product was good. I would even say it was great because of the technicalities behind it, but because the guys were just technicians, but none of them was like a marketer or more interested in psychology, they found it really difficult to market the product. And they wanted to sell at a premium price for in, in, an, in a niche where I, I'm not buying because I need a product. I'm buying it because I wanted it because I can't afford it. And that really didn't go too well. Um, so, so they yeah. have to be able to sell it. You, you can get the attention for them. But if they don't have the sales process in place, train wreck, right? Yeah, and so, I mean, they were great engineers, but for example, they had no clue on how to do a proper website. So it's like, we could drive traffic, whatever we want, but they weren't able to capture it because the, once the website wasn't loading and then the buttons weren't properly displaying or, you know, the color of the button wasn't actually a proper one. And so just different, different stories around that. But if you look like at a success story, one that, that I'm actually really proud of is we had, so this client approached us about two years ago now, and he was really desperate because he was like, hey, I'm just getting invoices from my agency for like thousands of dollars. I get no reports. I have no idea what they're doing. I don't know what's coming in. I'm just spending money, right? Like, please help me figure this out. And at that point in time, they were doing SEO and ads. And so we, we started with ads because we were like, okay, let us, let us try one thing and, and we make sure that works. And then we can look into the other one. And so we started doing ads and that was, I think about, yeah, it was November. And then December, we, we kind of re-ramped it. And then January ended up being the biggest sales month yet out of the last 12 months, which is kind of crazy because in January, everybody's like, you know, every e-commerce is like slowing down usually. Right. And we worked on several things. Then we started with SEO last year too. And then now they actually just crossed the $1 million mark. Um, I think one or two weeks ago from, you know, being a, a small six figure business. Um, and they are now spending more on ads than money they've made like three years ago in a business. Wow. Because it's just the, the ROI is about 10 to 11 times at any point in time. And yeah, we have another client who's also like last year, they made 100, 120, 130K a year. And now they already crossed the million dollar mark. So it's been really great to see that. And I think that's what's just fun for me. Like I get to help people grow their businesses, grow their impact. And with that also do more with their own lives. Right. I love that. So th this, uh, 
account that you're very proud of. They had a process in place where they could take all of these new potential relationships and set them up and run them through a sales process correctly, right? Yeah, they had a good website. They had a business model that was already bringing them money. They were profitable, right? So mm-hmm. in terms of like finances, they, they had their, their stuff together. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and they can also afford sometimes to, to spend a little bit of money on tests, a little bit of money on tests. So if a campaign doesn't work out, it's no big deal because we have other campaigns that are working anyway and they're gonna make up for it. So, yeah. So what's one question that you wish people would ask you, but they never do? What would, what's a question you wanna answer that really shows, um, yeah, your core essence? Um, oh God, that's a good one. I think when we start working with them, what is going to be my homework? Because quite some people think, oh, they're going to do ads. Everything is fine. But no, it's not just that we do ads. There's going to be a lot to do for you too, right? Talk website optimization, talk funnel optimization, email marketing, right? So yes, we come in with improving your ads but that's going to have a ripple effect into every single part of your business Mm -hmm. and yes we're going to free up time for you but you'll also have to do your own part of the work i love that so the ripple effect of making sure that your marketing automation is fine-tuned that you have a sales process in place that you have um, forms and uh, ways to capture and follow up on the folks that you're going to drive to them. Excellent. So uh, Pamela, if folks are wanting to connect with you and see how you might fit into their organization, how do they connect with you? Sure. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Pamela Wagner. And then if you kind of want to, you know, if you already got your campaigns running and you want to know how to optimize them better, then there's a, an optimization guide we created for Google search campaigns to kind of, you know, help you do exactly what we talked about today. And that's something you can find under bit.ly slash Google ads optimization. All right. Awesome. Pamela, you've been a great guest on the ROI online podcast, and I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Steve. It was a lot of fun. All right. And that's a wrap.